Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, so uh, my name is Mike Rosenthal, and uh, for the last six years I've been working with the American rock band OK Go. And they've had a pretty unusual trajectory through, through the music industry that I want to talk about uh, today. Uh, you know, for much of the last six years we've been working to define what it means to be a successful band in an industry that's really spent the better part of a decade uh, collapsing, and which is just recently starting to rebuild itself. Uh, to the extent that we've been successful, it's because we've done everything we can to break, break sort of out of the box of the traditional uh, revenue models for musicians uh, and essentially ignore them. Uh, we realized early on that people weren't going to be buying albums much longer and that we needed to find other ways to do things. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, OKGO OK is, is an American rock band. They, they got signed to Capitol Records in 2001 and released their first album uh, on Capitol in, in 2002. Um, they spent you know, a year or so touring around that album, uh, playing live shows you know, across the country. And, and they, they started running into a problem, which is that at their live shows, they'd go and they'd play these really energetic uh, rock concerts, and nobody was really dancing. And this kind of bummed them out. You know, they felt like people should be dancing. And this was kind of a problem in America in general at that time, which is people would sort of show up to a concert and sort of stand there stoically and just sort of nod their head. Um, and the band came up with a solution for this, which is that they, at a certain point in their live show, they decided that they were going to put down their instruments, uh, plus press play on a recording of, of one of their songs, and do a completely ridiculous synchronized dance uh, to that song. And the theory was that if they were dancing in this absurd manner, it would be harder for people to stand around and, and, and watch them. Um, and so they went to the lead singer's backyard, and they started rehearsing this dance routine. Um, and, and you know, they set up a camcorder so they could sort of watch themselves and see how they were doing. And it turned out that this video was actually really uh, ridiculous in and of itself. Uh, I'm going to play just a, a bit of it here for you now. They showed it to some friends, those friends thought it was really funny, they showed it to some other friends. Eventually somebody put it up on the internet. And this was pre-YouTube, you know, so they put it up on stupidvideos.com or something. And then a few weeks later, they realized that they had had over 50,000 downloads of this video. And this kind of blew their mind, because at the time, they hadn't sold anywhere near 50,000 copies of their album, and they certainly hadn't played in front of 50,000 people. So it was sort of this revelation for them that they could use the internet in this way and, and, and reach so many more people than, than they ever could uh, previously. So, so when it came time uh, to release their second album, you know, they knew that they wanted to make another video uh, as the music video for the first single from the album. So they went back to the lead singer's house, they went down to the basement, uh, they worked up a dance routine, and, and they shot a, a, another video. Uh, and this video, they, you know, they brought into Capitol Records in LA, they sat down in the big boardroom with all the music executives, and they said, right, okay, here it is on the big screen, this is the video that we want to have as, as the music video for, for, our, for our first single for this album. And it looked like this. You get the idea. Um, so, you know, when it was done, the, all the sort of label executives turned to them and basically said, this is the dumbest thing we've ever seen in our lives. Uh, if you show this to anybody, you guys are finished as a band. This is, this is ridiculous. So the band said, okay, fair enough, thank you. Uh, went home and put the video up on the internet. Uh, they thought it was funny. Again, they thought their friends would find it funny. Uh, and it turned out that they did. And now, th this music video basically became you know, the most viral video of its age. You know, at first it was hundreds of thousands and then millions and then tens of millions. You know, to date it's been viewed hundreds of millions of times. Uh, they ended up touring for three years on the back of this. They won a Grammy. This was, you know, this was really the, the pinnacle of, of their early success. Um, but the problem was that, you know, they, they got back from tour and they realized that the label had never really been able to convert all this success uh, into the sale of a little piece of plastic with music on it. This is basically the entire job of, of, of a major label at this time. Um, you know, and, and to, 
to their credit, the music industry in general was in bad shape. Uh, record sales were declining, the labels were doing all they could to stay afloat, and they were really only focusing on the very biggest hits at the label. Um, so the band kind of, you know, started complaining a lot to the label. They said, look, you know, we have all this success online, we're able to do all these things, but, you know, as a label, you're not really doing things for us, it's not working out, you know, maybe you just let us out of our contract, maybe we can kind of go our separate ways. Uh, the label said, no, you know, we're not quite ready to do that. So the band spent another couple years uh, recording their third album, and in 2009, which is when I came on board, uh, they released that album on Capitol. And then sort of a strange thing happened, which is that a few weeks later, Literally about a month after the album came out, Capitol said, you know what, you're right. You guys can go your separate way, can have your album back, go in peace, no hard feelings, let's, you know, let's just agree to, to no longer be in business together. Um, which was great, but we sort of found ourselves all of a sudden uh, as this independent band. We, we basically, you know, uh, we were free and clear to do whatever we wanted, and we had all these ideas about kind of, you know, how this could work, but we really had no idea what we were doing and, and really no idea of, of, of what to do next. Um, so what I want to talk about today are some of the issues that OK Go faced in leaving the major label system and becoming uh, an independent band, uh, because I think that some of the, you know, the strategies that we implemented and some of the lessons that we learned uh, can provide, you know, some, some insights sort of into where this industry is going. Um, but before I do that, I want to jump back to the 20th century, right? So when we talk about the history of the music industry, we're really talking about the history of the recorded music industry, right? And there's sort of this period from basically the late 1800s when records first became commercially available up until about 100 years later uh, when we suddenly realized that we could digitize things into ones and zeros and you sort of came into this MP3 world. Um, and, you know, within that 100-year period, the revenue model for music was relatively straightforward, right? You take a recording of music, you put it onto a physical object, like a cassette or a CD, and then you sell that object. And the people that make the music in the first place, they get some of the money, and the people that front the money for it and manufacture, market it, distribute the object, they get the rest. Right? And there's, you know, this wasn't always a fair split, and there's lots of stories about you know, artists getting screwed by the major labels and all this, but at least there was a clear value exchange. Right? There was money being exchanged for an object full of content. Uh, and really, you can talk about most mass media art in the 20th century in the same way. Right? So writers would write books, you'd sell a book. Painter would make a painting, sell a painting. Filmmaker would make a film, sell a film. Musician would make a little piece of plastic with music on it, and, and they would sell that. And you know, each of those boxes really had tightly defined rules in the way that value was being exchanged there. But by the early 2000s, those boxes were all completely falling apart across all media. And you really have two technologies that were uh, maturing simultaneously that are, that are fundamentally changing these content industries forever. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is the, is the digitization of content, right? The, the ability to convert media, like photos and music and videos, into ones and zeros meant that the media that used to require tremendous amounts of resources to manufacture and replicate could now take up zero physical space and be replicated billions of times at basically no cost, right? So this eliminated any inherent value in the physical representation of media basically overnight. You know, if making one album costs the same as making a billion albums, then according to, you know, traditional capitalism, it, it's absolutely absurd to continue to pay the same amount for one, right? We've eliminated the resource scarcity, we've removed most of the cost of, of production, so by definition it should be worth less. Uh, and then at the same time, you have the digitization of distribution, right? So suddenly all these ones and zeros, thanks to the internet, can be zipped around the world instantaneously, uh, again, basically for free, and requiring almost no physical infrastructure, at least not in the way that you would think about it when trying to transport physical goods. So people suddenly didn't have to go to a record store to buy a record anymore, right? They could get a digital version of it sitting at home in their bedroom. And so this completely disrupted the power structure in the whole music industry. Uh, the value that the labels have been providing for basically a century was, you know, they, they were providing the ability to take content, turn it into a physical object, and sell it. And they had built up all these complicated systems for doing so, all the, the factories and the trucks and the warehouses and the distribution centers uh, and even the record shops. They existed solely because they could turn a profit from, from dealing with this. So, so if the object was suddenly worthless, then the whole structure would basically come crashing down. And that crash is what we've been seeing for the last, you know, 15, 20 years. So, this is bad news for the middlemen, right? They, they, they were, you know, for the, all the labels and the distributors, uh, and you can kind of be tempted to say, who cares, 
right? You know, if it's good for the consumer, then it's good for everybody. Um, you know, and, and let's not forget that the record industry had a pretty bad history uh, in terms of innovation. You know, they knew that digital was coming for, you know, 10, 15 years before they did anything about it. All through the 90s, they were selling CDs, which was basically, you know, the cheapest recorded medium in the history of recorded mediums, and they were selling them for, you know, the highest prices that albums had ever been sold for. Um, so, you know, and, and instead of taking those profits and, and investing them in a digital future that they clearly saw coming, they were just taking those profits and going home. So, so it's easy to kind of make them out to be the bad guy. Um, but it turns out that what's bad for the middlemen is also really bad for the artist, right? Because the people who were paying to have all this music made in the first place was the major label system. It was, it was the record labels. Um, so they were really vital to the music ecosystem. They were the ones that would pay artists in advance to make an album. They'd pay for the studio sessions, they'd pay for the manufacturing, they'd pay for the marketing, they'd pay to get the artist on the radio, uh, and they'd you know, even pay to send them out on tour uh, to promote the album, uh, none of which the artists could have done themselves. Uh, and, and, and the big reason that this was so important was because most albums lose money, right? Most albums never sell anywhere near enough copies to recoup all the money that's spent on them, uh, let alone turn a profit. So the major labels were essentially serving as high-risk lenders, right? Much like a VC would in the startup world. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the, they would bid on hundreds of albums each year, knowing full well that only a handful of them would ever make any money. And the reason is the exact same reason that VC does this in the startup world, right? Because a few hits are going to make them a ton of money, right? So much that they're going to recoup all the losses that they've spent on all the other albums that they bet on that year and give them a profit and let them turn around and do the whole thing over again the next year. So this was a really fundamental part of the system, which basically bottomed out. So, you know, their OK Go is stuck in 2009 without any real clear way of, of uh, learning how to pay for, for anything anymore. So we spent some time looking around and we tried to find another system that was working, was even more trouble, you know, that was in more trouble than we were. Uh, and we spent some time looking at the advertising industry. See, if the digital revolution was bad for the content industries, it was really, really bad news for the advertising industry. And this is because they desperately required something that people did not have to give anymore, which was their attention. Uh, you know, they had historically made their money by inserting themselves in the content distribution chain. You know, if you wanted to watch a really cool television show, you had to watch their ad. If you wanted to listen to some good music on the radio, you had to listen to their commercials. Um, you know, so with these disruptions of production and distribution, suddenly that was no longer the case. People could download shows, watch them at home, download music, listen to them without commercials. So this was a, a major problem for them. Um, so suddenly they were facing this massive attention deficit. They had no way to get their, your eyes and ears on their content. So they did something that I think is pretty smart, arguably smarter than most anything that the music industry did, which is that they started inserting themselves back into content that you do care about. So instead of just focusing on commercials and trying to get you to watch things that you couldn't care less about, um, they started investing in associating themselves with cool content, right? They would, they would pay to have their products placed in a music video, or they would pay rappers to rap about their product, or they would invest even more heavily uh, in sponsoring tours uh, and you know, music festivals uh, and all that. You know, and all of that had been going on for years, but this took a massive uptick in the early 21st century, and it's just been going up and up uh, over the last 15 years. So in 2009, we looked around and we realized that we had content that millions of people wanted to watch, and that we knew brands were desperately trying to get in front of those same people. So we decided to test a theory about brand sponsorship. Um, so we actually approached a uh, company, State Farm Insurance, who had shown some interest uh, in working with us in 2009, uh, and we basically had the following conversation. We said, we want to make something that lots and lots of people want to see. We don't have any money to pay for it. You guys should pay for it and be associated with our cool content. Um, and, you know, in a lot of ways, this was kind of the age-old sponsorship model that had existed for a long time. But the key difference was that we retained complete creative control, right? This wasn't us coming in and saying, hey, let us make a State Farm ins insurance commercial, which, you know, we knew very well that none of our fans wanted to see. It was really, you know, there's no reference to their products or scenarios based on anything having to do with their message. And you know, we did make one concession, which was we showed their logo in, in the earliest part of the video. You know, I'll just, I'll show it to you here. Take a look. So this little truck has their logo on it.
fortunately for us, this video became a, a massive hit for us. You know, we, I think now we're up to almost 50 million views on this, ended up winning a, a ton of awards and, and getting a bunch of press, and really made State Farm Insurance look like geniuses uh, for, for, for being involved with us. Um, so this was great. You know, we kind of realized that, hey, okay, we, didn't, we never really sold that many albums. The whole industry isn't selling that many albums, but we can do this other thing that people actually want to see. You know, maybe we can use this as a model uh, and, and start doing more and more of this. Um, so we ended up making another almost 10 music videos around this album cycle, uh, and a bunch of them included uh, brand partners. I'll, I'll show you one more from this cycle. Um, obviously, these are all on YouTube. You can see them there. Um, so this one was sponsored by Chevy and it was used as part of their uh, Super Bowl ad campaign for American football in the year that, that, that it came out. You guys ready? Yeah. creative control and sometimes you run into problems with that and you know you have a brand that really wants you to fit things in that feels you know not super organic but every time the band fought really hard and this one was basically a brief where Chevy came to us and said what would you do with a car that was basically the entire question and we said well we do this really weird shit here um, and 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 they were a little nervous about that but it uh, you know it, it worked out this became you know the most watched video on YouTube on Super Bowl Monday which for American companies is a big deal um, so this was like you know in each case brands were able to see that there was a real return here and it worked out so so we were able to basically go on and and pay for the entire next uh, album release um, based on the success of these videos right so we were able to um, you know, pay for the recording, pay for releasing it ourselves, uh, and basically set ourselves up to go out and do it all over again. This is uh, the, the last video I'll show. This is from this most recent uh, album cycle, and this is a video that we did with uh, Honda in Japan. And I'll just skip to the middle, just where it gets a little more interesting. So you can sort of see this through line, right? Which in every case the band is still, you, sort of, you can see it back from, from when they're in the backyard uh, doing this synchronized dance routine. It's still, you know, it's these single shot videos that are really full of kind of wonder and joy, uh, you know, that, that do appeal to, to brands um, and that, you know, sort of take this you know, weird synchronized dance to these kind of absurd uh, conclusions. This video is actually shot at half speed, which is why it looks a little bit jerky, um, so that they could actually move around on these little Honda Cub cycles that only go about two miles an hour. Um, and, and, and this video was actually shot with a drone, which is how you get these uh, sort of sweeping crane shots uh, that you see throughout it without having a lot of infrastructure and how you actually get it all to happen uh, in, in, in one take. Um, so, you know, kind of what we had done here, just to kind of, you know, abstract it a little bit, is to really kind of subvert the, the, the traditional value exchange, right? And uh, I'm sorry to leave this and go to a boring slide, but, but, but the, 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 the historic or the traditional content value exchange was very simple, right? The band supplies some content, 
the label supplies the marketing and distribution, and the fan supplies the funding, right? Make a thing, sell a thing, it's right here. It's all, it's all very straightforward. And, and what we basically learned that we could do was uh, set up a new value exchange, which is that the band basically functions as label and band, right? So we're responsible for creating the content, uh, marketing it, and distributing it. Um, and this can happen on the smallest level, right? You can make an album at home in, in your home studio, you can put it up on SoundCloud, uh, that's your distribution, and you can tell people about it on Facebook, right? And that's your marketing. So right there, you know, that's kind of all, all those pieces bundled up uh, in one. Uh, the fan supplies the attention, right? Because suddenly this is the thing that has some value. Uh, I mean, it has value to us because we want them to watch our content, but it really has value to the brand and it has enough value for the brand that they're able to supply the funding, uh, especially advancing the money for, you know, a video production like this uh, to make the whole thing possible. Um, and, you know, obviously this is a bit of a simplification. There's kind of a million variations on how this plays out. Um, but this, you know, shift in the value exchange opens up all sorts of possibilities for bands. Um, you know, artists, I think, really need to start pulling together all the different revenue streams and, and, and figuring out ways to make money uh, with this new kind of dynamic, right? Not everyone's going to want to make zany music videos for a living. Some artists really just want to make the album, you know, sort of uh, speak to their fans uh, with, with whatever they have, but they're going to have to figure out ways uh, to pursue that that makes it work. So, you know, the, the big question and kind of where I want to leave it is, you know, how does an artist make money in the 21st century? Um, and I, I would answer that basically the, the biggest thing is that they need to control the relationship with their fan, right? It's no longer enough to kind of have all these middlemen controlling that relationship because that can go away uh, if, if those power structures go away. Um, you know, and, and having this relationship is a source of all sorts of uh, potential revenue. Uh, it's, it's sort of the equivalent of owning the means of distribution uh, in a previous era. Um, you know, and, and really the, the way that this works um, in terms of actually bringing you a profit is if you build that fan base as large as possible. And that's kind of obvious, but these are sort of the steps as I see them. You know, not every band is OK Go, and they're not all going to have millions and millions of views, but the brand sponsorships that we have are only possible because we have a direct channel of access to our fan base. Um, you know, and this allows us to be much more nimble than we ever could have been in the major label system, it allows us to iterate, allows us to get instant feedback, uh, and allows us to react to it. Um, and, and, and the big picture here is to, that owning this large fan base allows you to monetize them in ways that feel authentic to you. So for OK Go, that's having a brand sponsorship of a video. For other artists, it could be all sorts of other uh, ways of making money. So actually, yeah, how, how, what are those ways? Um, I mean, I'll run through some of them in case there are artists here in the audience. But I, I would say that... Um, a big one is digital streaming and album sales. Okay, the album sales are nowhere near as important as they were. Some people still buy them, let them do so. Digital streaming is uh, still a very small amount of revenue for artists, but with things like Spotify and Apple Music and all this, uh, that's gonna add up uh, eventually to, to a much more substantial part of your revenue stream. Another big one is touring, especially if you have a sizable fan base. Uh, this can be a really reliable uh, you know, means of support and allows you to reach your fans. And the other side of this is actually experiences, something that OK Go has done a lot on their most recent tour is selling uh, VIP tickets to their tours, which allows people to come in early, see the sound check, meet the band, hang out. And for fans who are really hardcore fans, this is easily worth more money and, and can really uh, add up. Third one is merch. Very obvious, but anything that is not yet turned into a one or a zero, you can still sell to people. Uh, you can sell them t-shirts, you can sell them hats, you can sell them vinyl copies of your albums. Um, you know, anything like that also adds up um, and helps you know, connect you to your fans. Um, crowdfunding, this is a big one in the States right now. I don't know if it's big here, but you know, people are really into using Kickstarter and Pledge Music and these sorts of places. If you have a large fan base, uh, they're really into what you're doing. You can almost have the same conversation that an OK Go would with a brand, which is to say, you know, hey, fans, we really want to make this cool thing. We don't have any money. You know, can you, you, why don't you come on board and share the experience and, and, and help us make that happen? Uh, and the final one, obviously, brand partnerships, right? This obviously works for us, uh, but this is, you know, this is trickling down and out into all sorts of areas of the music industry, and, and brands are more interested interested in this than ever before because of that attention issue that they're having. And so even smaller bands or bands in a, you know, real niche uh, communities can really leverage this, and, and a lot of bands aren't. So this is actually a place that I think there's going to be a uh, huge growth. Um, and that's it. Thanks a lot.
Okay, uh, we still got a couple of minutes, so uh, you ready to take a couple of questions, sure. just yes. in case? Any questions, Mike? Yeah. Hey, uh, first of all, I love OK Go, so it's really cool to, to see you talk about, uh, about that. Uh, so let's say I'm a, an artist that starts now. What would be the first things that I would do for actually getting that fan base? Because the ways that you mentioned on monetizing, it's already if you have fan base. Yes, for sure, absolutely. So what and to do to build my fan base? Yeah, and I didn't get down into the weeds on, on that because you know, the, the, the biggest advice from OK Go's side is be on a major label for 10 years first, right? If you can do that, do that. Uh, they, they had millions of dollars worth of money put into them before they tried to make it independent. So it's not fair for me to say, you know, apples and oranges there. Um, but in terms of talking to the bands who are, are getting started or trying to build that base, I mean, start local and build it up. I mean, I see time and again, um, there's an American band called Walk the Moon, which has a number one single right now, which is huge in the States, maybe here too. Um, and those guys started with just this insane very, very small fan base uh, in Ohio, where they're from. And they just toured locally, literally within you know, the three or four towns where they were, and that fan base was so dedicated to them and so loyal, even though they were small, they basically you know, infected people with this energy and this excitement for this band, and build it up, and build it up, and build it up. I mean, it's literally the same thing that's worked for 100 years. Right, is just find the people who are close to you, get them very excited, but now you have these amplification tools of social media, get those people excited enough that they're gonna go cheerlead for you elsewhere. Because it's one thing for you as a band to say, yeah, yeah, we're great. It's much more important for, people, for ordinary people and friends to say, hey, this band is awesome, you need to go see them. So, so um, how did Taylor Swift become the CEO of Apple? <laughs> I don't have an answer to that question. She's got a lot of power, and they listen. I think that was coming anyway, but uh, that certainly helped. I don't know. Anyone else? Yeah. So uh, for a lot of artists, like doing brand partnerships or uh, other stuff you talked about, or even from my experience, even some artists are opposed to the idea of VIP tickets. Uh, they, they consider it kind of like selling out or exploiting the fans. Yeah. So. What's your recipe for the success? Because definitely OK Go is like the number one art, the band in the world to do those new cool things. Yeah. Which no, I mean, that was my number one fear when I first started working with the band. Because I, I grew up in a time where if a band was associated with a brand, you look like a sellout. I mean, I, that was a word. Right? That was like the word we used to say. You talk to people who are 10 or 15 or 20 years younger than I am, they basically don't know what that word means anymore. That's just like, they, they're somehow, that has like, not, no longer part of the conversation. And I don't know why. And every time there's a new OK Go video, I live in fear that that's gonna be, you know, the, the, the conversation. Um, I will say that, you know, from my point of view in terms of handling their digital strategy and communication with their fans, for us it's always been about being 100% transparent about why we're doing what we're doing. I mean, we literally go on Facebook and our email newsletter and these places and say, hey, we want to make this really batshit crazy thing. It's super expensive. We don't have any money. These guys over here are going to pay us a bunch of money to do it. Like, we just want to give it to you for free. Like, this is, like, that's what's happening right now. And so far, knock on wood, it's, it's worked out. I'm crazy about those videos, and I had no idea whatsoever that they were sponsored. Great, then, then so we're doing a bang <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> Yeah, a great job, definitely. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Okay, we're going to wrap it up there. Right. Once again, many thanks to Mike Roisenthal. Thanks. Thanks, guys.